again everyone and welcome to the Living in Faith Everyday Podcast, the Life Podcast. We're continuing together to work through the series of 66 short podcasts that have been titled 66 Books. There are 66 short overviews of all the books of our Bible. And today we've reached the book of Hebrews, the book of the superiority of Christ. Hebrews has been called one of the greatest theological essays in the New Testament, but many today still struggle with it a great deal. The text does not mention the name of the author, but traditionally it was attributed to Paul the Apostle. However, doubt on Paul's authorship in the church was reported as early as the 4th century by Eusebius. Modern biblical scholarship considers its authorship unknown. Though the writer's style reflects some of Paul's writing characteristics, but there are key differences. The two leading candidates today are Paul and Barnabas. But I would always bear in mind when looking at this issue, as I will for a moment, that the authorship of the book itself makes no claim to an individual's authorship. The argument for the author being Paul are these. Firstly, whoever wrote it was obviously an educated Jew. Secondly, there is a similarity of style and a style of thought between Hebrews and Paul's other letters. We know that this author had also been in bonds. In other words, he had been in chains from Hebrews 10.34. We know that it was written from what we would today call Italy, from Hebrews 13.14. And we know whoever wrote it was closely associated with Timothy because he refers to Timothy in Hebrews 13.23. From about 190 AD through to the first questioning on the authorship in the 3rd century, there was a traditional view within the church that Paul wrote Hebrews. But there has also been an argument that Barnabas was the author. The reasons for this are... Barnabas was a Levite, and the writer of this book showed a great deal of knowledge of the Levite system. Whoever wrote it was at least familiar with the teachings of Paul, which of course Barnabas was, and whoever wrote it, as I said before, knew Timothy, and of course Barnabas knew Timothy well. And some very early traditions in the church, like Tertullian, favoured Barnabas as the author. Those who consider that Barnabas was most likely the author have to confess that the arguments in favour of Paul also fit Barnabas and vice versa. It is interesting to note that Paul signed all his letters but Hebrews remained anonymous. Barnabas generally stayed in the background not signing his name. I think the early church father, Oregon, summed this whole debate up for us when he said, Who it was that really wrote this epistle? God only knows. So thinking about the recipients. You see, at the time that the book of Hebrews was written, the sacrificial system was still in operation. We know that through several references throughout the book in chapters 8, 10 and 13. Therefore, since the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, Hebrews must have been written before that date. Also, we know within the text that Hebrews mentions Timothy in chapter 13, verse 23. Now, if Paul is not the author, this would suggest that Paul was dead. Otherwise, Timothy would have expected to join him. Therefore, we know for sure that Hebrews was written between the death of Paul, but before the destruction of Jerusalem, so probably in either 68 or 69 AD. And the recipients were clearly Jewish Christians. Now, during the reign of Nero, AD 54 to 68, the persecution of Christians had increased considerably, and we've covered that in some of the earlier books we've looked at. This caused some Jewish Christians to wonder if if they'd done the right thing in giving up the Jewish religion and becoming Christians. And with the increasing persecution, some of the Jewish Christians became discouraged. 
This letter to the Hebrews, as it is described, was written to reassure these new Jewish believers and prevent them from slipping back into their former religious practices. The writer wanted to reassure these discouraged Jewish believers that Jesus Christ was the true fulfillment of the Jewish faith. The Old Testament would find its completion in him. He is far above prophets, angels and any leaders and priests. And these sacrifices had done for those who received this letter what the Israelite sacrifices could never do. Nothing of human initiative can add to God's way of salvation. For what Christ has done is final, the writer writes in chapter 10, verses 12 to 13. So thinking about the message of this book. Present-day readers sometimes find the book of Hebrews difficult to understand because the writer refers repeatedly to the regulations and the ceremonies of the very ancient Israelite religion. But remember, his readers would have been very familiar with, with what he was talking about. You see, the writer of the Hebrews wanted to show that once Christ came, the old covenant was of no further use. His death on the cross did what all of Israel's laws and ceremonies could not do. It brought an eternal cleansing from sin and the right to enter God's presence for any individual who approaches that way. Christ's death established a new covenant, a new promise, a new way, one that is perfect and would last forever. The message is that Jesus who stands in a sense as a divine king and priest, he is therefore superior to Judaism. Believers should never go back to the old ways, but should by faith approach the Lord and endure so that they may reach maturity and be rewarded. The literary structure of this book is quite distinctive. It is generally classified as an epistle, but it lacks an opening greeting, being more like an essay in the form of a letter. The contents of Hebrews suggest that it is in fact a sermon placed within a letter format. The letter does begin with a prologue in the first four verses, and then from chapters 1 through to chapter 5, there is an unpacking of what salvation through Christ means, how those who follow Christ are God's true people, how we should struggle through and achieve growth through perseverance, looking at the old priesthood and sacrifice in the light of Christ's new promise, and then in the closing chapters there is a call to endurance in the genuine faith, and finally the letter closes with the personal greetings and benediction. So thinking about why was this book written? Well, the first purpose of Hebrews was to check the drift from Christ back to legalistic Judaism. Christ is shown to be superior to prevent this drift from occurring. The old covenant was never intended to be a way of salvation. The law of Moses was not a means by which people could earn forgiveness. However, it did help people see their sin and also see God's holiness and thereby encourage them to turn in faith to God and ask for mercy. When Christ came, he did what the law could not do, for by paying sin's penalty, he made forgiveness possible for all who were repentant. The purpose of this book is to show us that no one can be saved by keeping the law, or any law. It talks about Abraham living before the Old Covenant was established, and how David lived on under the Old Covenant, but both were saved in the same way, by faith. Under the Old Testament laws, people offered sacrifices or offerings to God as expressions of their devotion to Him. Different sacrifices, we know, were appointed for different purposes, but all contained some element of atonement. This is some part of the ritual symbolically represented God's ability to deal with sin's penalty. But this also points out that the one offering the sacrifice could be restored in right relationship with God. It all contained some element of atonement, that is some part of the ritual that dealt with sin's penalty, so that the one offering the sacrifice could be restored into a right relationship with God. In the sacrifice of an animal, for example, the worshipper may have presented it as a personal substitute, and on the basis of the animal's death, they would ask God for forgiveness. The person knew that because death was the penalty of sin, there could be no forgiveness of sin apart 
from death. And the sacrifice was God-given means of expressing faith in that truth. Forgiveness through blood meant, in other words, forgiveness through the death of a guiltless substitute. Hebrews 9.22 tells us that. Yet it also tells us in chapter 10 that animal sacrifices could not take away sins. They were a temporary arrangement for Old Testament times that gave people a way to demonstrate something that they had already felt, shown and believed. It demonstrated their repentance, their faith and obedience. These sacrifices also taught people what that atonement involved. Whether people knew it or not, the sacrifice of Christ for them today was the means by which God forgave them when they turned to faith in Him. And the secondary, well, some might say a more minor purpose of Hebrews, was to challenge those receiving it to remain resolute and gain maturity and not slip back into their own ways. They are, were to remain steadfast and mature because if they do, Hebrews 10, 35 and 36 tells us they will be rewarded. So to summarize this book, a writer, perhaps Barnabas, perhaps Paul, wrote to Jewish Christians arguing that since Christ, who is superior to Judaism in every way, they should not go back to those practices, but rather they should endure by faith, endure so that they will indeed be rewarded. Believers who by faith and endure were told they will grow in maturity and be rewarded in the kingdom to come. The writer to Hebrews had a special concern for these new Jewish Christians. He wants to impress upon them that although Israelite's religious system prepared the way from Christ, it was not the thing that could save guilty sinners. Christ is, was and always will be the only way to salvation.